Well, this is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad. Amen. I'm a little bit of a weather nerd myself, and so I'm grateful for the snow that we're receiving. Uh, anyone in, uh, in Tulare County uh, is happy for whenever we get precipitation, because everything that we do here in town and in this county is dependent upon the wonderful snowfall that the Lord provides for us. Well, we have a great miracle to examine this morning in this sermon series. We've been uh, going through some of the miracles of, uh, that Jesus had performed as recorded in the Gospel of John. And this morning, uh, Ellie Flynn is going to come and read the scripture. If you turn your Bibles, if you're online, uh, you can do that with us. Or if you have your phone, uh, beginning there in John chapter 9, verse 1. Dave, good morning, church. As he said, we're beginning in John chapter 9, verse 1. As Jesus was walking along, he saw a man who had been blind from birth. Rabbi, his disciples asked him, why was this man born blind? Was it because of his own sins or his parents' sins? It was not because of his sins or his parents' sins, Jesus answered. This happened so the power of God could be seen in him. We must quickly carry out the tasks assigned to us by the one who sent us. Night is coming, and and then no one can work. But while I am here in the world, I am the light of the world. Then he spit on the ground, made mud, mud with the saliva, and spread the mud over the blind man's eyes. He told him, go wash yourself in the pool of Siloam. So the man went and washed and came back seeing. His neighbors and others who knew him as a blind beggar asked each other, isn't this the man who used to sit and beg? Some said he was, and others said, no, he just looks like him. But the beggar kept saying, yes, I am the same one. They asked, who healed you? What happened? He told them, the man they called Jesus made mud and spread it over my eyes and told me, go to the pool of Siloam and wash yourself. So I went and washed, and now I can see. Where is he now, they asked. I don't know, he replied. Then they took the man who had been blind to the Pharisees, because it was on the Sabbath that Jesus had made the mud and healed him. The Pharisees asked the man all about it, so he told them, He put the mud over my eyes, and when I washed it away, I could see. Some of the Pharisees said, This man Jesus is not from God, for he is working on the Sabbath. Others said, But how could an ordinary sinner do such miraculous signs? So there was a deep division of opinion among them. Then the Pharisees again questioned the man who had been blind and demanded, What's your opinion about this man who healed you? The man replied, I think he must be a prophet. The Jewish leaders still refused to believe the man had been blind and could now see, so they called in his parents. They asked them, is this your son? Was he born blind? If so, how can he now see? His parents replied, we know this is our son and that he was born blind, but we don't know how he can see or who healed him. Ask him. He is old enough to speak for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders who had announced that anyone saying Jesus was the Messiah would be expelled from the synagogue. That's why they said, he is old enough. Ask him. So for the second time, they called in the man who had been blind and told him, God should get the glory for this, because we know this man, Jesus, is a sinner. I don't know whether he is a sinner, the man replied, but I know this. I was blind, and now I can see. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. Amen. 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 Wow. I don't know if this man is a sinner or not, but one thing I know is that I was blind but now I can see. Amen? Amen. Wow. Uh, hey, if kids have not been dismissed yet to uh, Children's Church, you may be, uh, do so now with uh, Christy Mueller and looks like Patty Hilton. And uh, we thank you for teaching our kids about the same story we're, we're uh, studying this morning. Um, it's interesting, uh, in preparing for this sermon, I noticed that... Uh, there's a, a, one of the observations is that um, it's kind of surprised how callous uh, the religious leaders are in this story. And as we'll examine, uh, they've kind of emotionally removed themselves from the needs of people around them. They're distracted from the natural emotion of compassion and have insulated themselves from the needs of normal human beings. Uh, beings because of the observance uh, of their law to not heal someone on the Sabbath. It's kind of a, almost a religious sociopathology. Uh, so, Pastor, what is, what is 
pathology. What's a, what's a sociopath? Uh, the Mayo Clinic tells us that sociopathic behavior is a mental health disorder characterized by disregard for other people. Those afflicted with this personality disorder tend to treat others harshly and with callous indifference. They show no guilt or remorse for their negative and destructive behavior. So in this story, there was a man who was born blind and been blind for all of his life. Uh, he was a man in the community in Jerusalem, and Jesus took compassion on him and healed him. But it's obvious that the religious leaders cared more about their law, the Levitical law, than the needs of this man. They seem insulated from his need. Something miraculous had taken place. There was a, a, a lot of cause for celebration, yet the Pharisees were neurotically removed from this moment because of their law. And wow, the Pharisees were so exasperated by this blind beggar at the end of the story that they threw the poor guy out of the synagogue. Uh, these guys were like religious sociopaths that had removed themselves uh, from normal human emotion. So welcome to Sociopath Sunday as we examine what could be some pitfalls of legalistic religion. Uh, it's a scary example of how religious people can become detached from their own hearts. Uh, following this healing, the Pharisees began to interrogate this man, probably a young man, maybe 14 or 15 years old because he was of age, his parents said. And in verse 13, John says the Pharisees wanted to know how this man had received his sight. And the blind man says, it's the mud, the mud. And then I did what he told me to and washed off the mud and now I can see. And now this blind man was a person in their community who had experienced a miracle. And there seemed to be no positive emotional response from these guys. Um, instead, they wanted to trap Jesus, who was breaking one of their rules. And they have had two competing uh, opinions among them. The first is that Jesus is a sinner and should be rejected. Uh, this group also assumed that Jesus was demon-possessed. And the second group uh, question, how can a sinner perform such a miracle? The Pharisees obviously had missed the main point of Jesus having healed the blind man. They didn't get the answer that they wanted from the blind man, so they went to interrogate his parents. His parents said, yes, he's been blind from birth, and they didn't want to acknowledge that Jesus was a prophet, so they told the Pharisees to go back to their son saying, oh, he can speak for himself. So the Pharisees returned to the man who has been blind and for a second uh, round of questioning, and in doing so, victimizing uh, the victim. Uh, he had been made whole, and yet rather than celebrating and accepting the man, they rejected him and threw him out of the synagogue. I call them a bunch of old goats. <laughs> About this man's blindness and pharisaical law, it's absurd, uh, to, it seems to us, in this day and age, and it was widely held that suffering, especially in such a physical problem as blindness, was due to sin. But Jesus set them straight, and he said, Neither this man nor his parents sinned. Jesus, got the, uh, Jesus pointed the question away from why is the man blind and moved on to the idea, what can God do in this? He was probably thinking something like, How can I mend his broken body? Or... I think I'm going to restore his sight or that the work. And it says there in verse three, so that the work of God might be displayed in him. This is really important point that Jesus reveals in this one sentence. Neither this man nor his parents sinned. And it has application for us. So this is where we need to kind of bear down and focus. Hang with me a little bit. I'm going to go, go into some Christian theology, biblical theology. It's a profound point that most physical ailments do not, are not due to personal sin, nor is disease a byproduct of an angry, retributive God. However, all infirmities have originated because of the fallen man and exist due to the problem of evil in the world. Amen? Yeah. These things cannot be blamed on God, even though many people blame him for natural catastrophes and personal tragedies. But God does not cause cancer or epidemics. All evil things originate from Lucifer and his damning hold on mankind. 
The whole human race lives with the reality of imperfection and disease. Everyone experiences sickness and less than ideal physical conditions. We're all broken in some way. The handicaps that we live with are simply a matter of degree. Some of us have to wear glasses. Some of us have braces on our teeth. And still others might be dealing with chronic illness. The miracles of Jesus reveal a compassionate God who loves to heal people. During Jesus' ministry on earth, often the best way to find him was to seek out those who were looked down upon. Jesus often sought them out in order to show that God's love for us does not depend on our merits or abilities, much less our outward appearance. In the story, Jesus had previously noticed that the blind man sitting, was sitting outside the temple and begging for money, as those with infirmities had no way to make a living and they were considered unclean and they could not enter into the temple. It's kind of the opposite of what we have here. Anybody can walk into our tent that wants to all, all uh, week long. Notice that Jesus notices hurting people. If you're hurting today, you can be sure that Jesus sees you. What a marvelous thought. That's something to take home with you. Jesus is looking at you right now. Sitting at the right hand of God the Father. And not only is he looking at you, every time you say a prayer, he's going, it says in Hebrews that he's interceding for us. What a wonderful thought. Now, Jesus was revolutionary in whom he welcomed into his life. People with infectious diseases, adulterers, social outcasts, and a lot of religious, hypocritical sociopaths like these Pharisees. His life teachings and miracles are reinforced by the way that he loved people. Interestingly, what is often seen as infirmity in the eyes of the world can actually become a blessing from God. I have a dear friend. Um, he's part of our family group, a guy named Bobby Bell. And Bobby lost his eyesight many years ago. Yet he told me that um, when he had his physical eyesight, unfortunately, he walked in spiritual blindness. However, as he explained to this congregation on Cardboard Testimony Sunday, some of you remember that five years ago, some of you oldsters, that even though Bobby has lost his physical sight, he has acquired spiritual vision that he did not have when he was physically sighted. Bobby told me again this week that the loss of his physical eyesight caused him to acquire a dynamic spiritual eyesight. And he is more grateful for his spiritual vision than he was of his physical vision. Wow. Talk about spiritual insight. Not all are so wise. The new Bible commentary puts it this way. In sharing this story with us, John rejects the idea that just because Jesus performs a miracle, people will automatically put their trust in him. This miracle should have convinced Jesus' accusers that they had obviously missed the point. This miracle should have persuaded them that Jesus was indeed the fulfillment of the law that they accused him of breaking. Jesus threatened their system and religious power. Their power was political as well as religious, and we get into trouble whenever that has happened in church history. But that's another sermon. We're not going to go into that. Well, are Jesus' miracles enough for you to trust him today and the rest of your life? Perhaps you need for the Lord to heal you of something today. God is still healing people every day all over the world. Isn't that a great thought? Sometimes God heals physically. Think about this for a moment. Is there anyone here that's been healed physically by the Lord? Just raise your hand as a testimony. Thank you, Lord. Anyone here that has been healed emotionally 
by the Lord. Please raise your hand. Yes. Sometimes he heals us through our confession of sin and brings forgiveness and cleansing to our souls. It is God's ultimate desire to heal us from sin through repentance and forgiveness. In 1 John 1, 9, it says, If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. To cleanse us, to katharizo, to cleanse us, to where we get the English word catharsis, or a cathartic forgiveness of all the yucky stuff in our lives. That's not good English, but it's good theology. Amen? Yes. Okay, life application. Is there any mud that you need to wash from your eyes in response to this story today? There's lots of mud around. It rained last night. It rained yesterday. Let me suggest a couple things that we might help us cleanse our visually impaired eyes. The first thing would be repentance. Repentance. Let's turn away from the things that would destroy our relationship with God and our relationship with others. Well, what is repentance? It's turning from the sin that we know is killing us on the inside. And God has promised to open our eyes if we will be obedient and go wash off the mud. Here are some uh, repentance questions. Do you have any religious pathologies? like these grumpy old Pharisees? Do you struggle with legalism, religion by the law? You might say, oh, pastor, I'm not legalistic. Well, maybe then you struggle with the other side of the coin. Well, what is the other side of the coin? Perhaps you struggle with antinomianism, which is Christianity, without any moral standards whatsoever. If you're antinomian, you excuse sin in your life, and discount the ethical and moral teachings of Jesus. Let that sink in. Some things you should hear in a sermon and say, I need to think about that this week. Let me just say that again. Antinomians, you excuse sin in your life and discount, discount the ethical and moral teachings of Jesus. Okay, the second thing that might give us better clarity is reconciliation. Last Sunday, our district pastor, Pastor Rob Songer, challenged us with an invitation to participate in a a ministry of reconciliation. We have a responsibility in the kingdom of God to bring reconciliation wherever we find ourselves. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, Paul describes it like this. All this is from God who reconciled to us himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself through Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he committed to us a ministry of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors of love. That might not be in the earliest translations of the Greek text. But we are Christ's ambassadors, I added, of love. As we... Sit here in God's tent of love. Amen? As though God was making an appeal through us, we are Christ's ambassadors, and we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. And I might add, be reconciled to one another. This means that we are to be ambassadors of racial reconciliation, of political reconciliation. We're called to be peacemakers in the face of violence of bringing healing between those that may be diametrically opposed to one another. So I ask you, have we placed our political opinion above our priority of the kingdom of God to be ministers of reconciliation? Don't you know, it's easy to watch media and get all worked up about opinions and miss our main responsibility of going and making disciples. Amen? We are called to love on, a, and love on an agitated and sin-sick world. Would it be that our political opinions would be so strong as to drive us away from the love of God or drive others away from the love of God? If so, let us repent of that today. Let us n- not let our political opinions short-circuit what God intends to do through the church. 
And what does God intend to do through the church? He intends to change the world through his Oh, you guys got it. That's the main point. Jesus intends to change the world through his Amen. And ironically, God has chosen us to be the only option of loving people to his kingdom. For he has rescued us from the domain of darkness and has transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Colossians chapter 1. What a marvelous message to us. He's rescued us from that domain of darkness and brought us into a ministry of reconciliation. Pastor Rob challenged us last week to pray for those that are of different political opinions than us and to pray for the sake of our country and for the sake of the gospel of love. And I think we all can respond in obedience. And metaphorically, we need to go wash the mud from our eyes. What it is in our lives that has inspired our vision for those who need hope in this time of difficulty, in this time of loss, in this time of our world being reorganized. Jesus still desires obedience. He desires our obedience, and through obedience, he intends to heal us and to heal the wounds of ourselves, our family, our community, and our country. The obvious teaching here is that God is still a God of miracles. He loves to heal. Healing is part of his character, part of who he is. He wants to heal us and to restore our health on every level. Well, thirdly, this sermon, this passage of scripture can give us a clear vision for the future. He can help cleanse our visually impaired lives. Many of you have been praying that not only would we survive the pandemic, but that it would provide opportunities for us to grow and make many, many disciples of Jesus. I recently received impassioned messages this week from several saints of the church that let me know that they were praying for our church to be reborn out of this pandemic. One of them said, we don't need another sermon. We just need to get about loving people with the love of Jesus. This certainly resonates with us. Don't you agree? How could it be that God could use something terrible to do something eternally wonderful? It reminds me of what the angel Gabriel said in his proclamation to Mary, the mother of Jesus, as recorded in Luke chapter 1, with God all things are possible. So there lies before us a challenge to restore the sight and vision of the church. It is our latest challenge, and we are praying and asking the Lord that he will open the eyes of our hearts to see what it is that he has for us. Three observations in closing. How will the church look different in the future because of the pandemic? Number one, online worship is here to stay. Perhaps hundreds are watching or will watch this morning's worship time and be drawn closer to God because of technology and a caring church. More than half of our congregations will be worshiping online with us this morning. Number two, the church is not a building. To us that are physically here this morning, this is most obvious. Just call me Pastor Obvious. We thank the Lord for this wonderful tent, the tent of God's love. The church can take many forms, and our vision is that the loving mission of Jesus will be resurrected in the form that he desires. 
My thought is that, yes, we'll return to worship times inside. Many people are looking forward to that especially on chilly morning. But isn't, that a marvelous, isn't this a marvelous experience too, to be in God's great out of doors? And we'll never forget it. What do we want to be different in the future? My thought is also that our family groups will perhaps be the most dynamic way that God can work outside the church building. How does that look in the future of your life and the life of the church? Third observation is a chance to clarify our mission to the community that we live in. How are we going to reach Tulare County with the contagious love of Jesus? We need a pandemic of love. I'm praying that an outbreak of contagious love for the lost and hopeless, wonderful people of our county. Some of them might be on the margins of society, Some of them might be headed for Hades in a Mercedes. But God is looking to heal all people. Panta ethne. All people. And we should be doing the same. What vision of clarity is Jesus giving for you for lost people? As we've been here, if God is laying someone on your heart to pray for and to talk to, Write that down. Write it in, your, in the flyleaf of your Bible. That the Holy Spirit this morning quickened your heart to pray for someone who is just wandering and needs hope. Maybe someone who's facing loss of loved one. Maybe someone who's facing loss of a job. Maybe someone who's facing all sorts of difficulties. Pray for the opportunity to wash off the mud. Well, I hope you guys are getting a vision for the future. I see some of you here that I haven't seen in a long time, and I'm glad that you're alive and kicking. As Pastor Rob said last week, I don't know, I've been thankful to be alive anywhere. As I was last week here. Well, let me give you this benediction. Let's stand together. Amen. Now may the God of all peace, who brought back from the dead that great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the everlasting covenant, equip you now For every good work, accomplishing that which is well-pleasing unto God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Let's say this together too. Help us with the uh, American Sign Language. This means love. Can you do this? Love. Love God. Live as a family. And go and make disciples. Have a great day.